needs no introduction. Many of you are in his classes and know his work on U.S. food policy. He's really a leader in that field. So I asked Park, well, what's something people might not know about your career? And he said that he used to work summers on his grandparents' um, cattle farm in Oklahoma. So I know many of you actually do have lived experience of farming, and so that's a really nice connection also with Park. So without further ado, Park, take it away. We are so interested to know what do we need to know about the U.S. Farm Bill. Thank, thanks for the introduction. And I've got a lavalier mic, and I'll put this here. They, um, yeah, boy, my grandfather would be very disappointed in me. He, uh, he had a cattle farm outside of Tulsa, and worked his day job was as a petroleum development geologist so he would have a hundred reasons to think my career had gone off the rails at some point now the um uh so today we're going to be talking about what nutrition and health sciences researchers should know about the u.s farm bill which is an important topic because it's very current right now in the periodic update to this important legislation the federal government is trying to figure out what should change and what should be the same for the next five or 10 year, 10 year period. And um, my uh, clicker just ended with that change. Yeah. Hang on. There we go. Thank you. And um, so the Food and Environment Research Network and Mother Jones uh, just this month had an article series about the Farm Bill that laid out how inscrutable the farm bill is to audiences outside of the traditional ag policy constituency. And this is bad for democratic decision-making about important food system issues that are at stake in the farm bill. So we can think of, you know, as you sort of prepare questions and I'll make sure not to go over my, my allotted time for the first part. So this can be very conversational. The broad question at stake in this, in this presentation is, in what respects does the farm bill help or harm nutrition and the environment? And you can think and start to scribble down your own, uh, your own more detailed questions about things about food and agricultural policy that you wish, um, you wish had been clearer. Uh, things like, for example, does the farm bill subsidize meat production or does the farm bill make unhealthy food cheaper? Actually, you don't need to write those two down because one way or another we'll co 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 cover those two at least in the, in the next few minutes. Um, I spend a lot of time approaching this type of policy issue, not from the perspective of what would I do if I were the monarch, the benevolent monarch and could decide, you know, we always put ourselves in that position. What do we think ought to be? I have, I've been losing policy battles for so many decades now that I've no longer got any patience to pretend I was the monarch. Uh, instead, I think a lot about what advocacy coalitions and shifting, shifting advocacy coalitions could pass policies that are better than what we have today. And you think about the key stakeholders include not just the farm operators who are themselves disaggregated by region, sector, you know, which crop they, they produce and small and large scale, but also farm labor who is usually underrepresented in political power of food manufacturers who have exactly the opposite opinion from farmers about what direction farm prices ought to go, um, input suppliers, including everything from tractors to petroleum to genetically modified seed producers, anti-hunger and nutrition advocates, who, as we'll discuss, are on nine days out of 10 uh, important allies to each other, and on one day out of 10 find themselves on opposite side of the fence on a particularly noisome um, uh, policy, policy proposal, for, for example, for nutrition assistance. And environmentalists and climate action supporters who likewise are largely thought of as being large uh, synonymous, except that to some extent by choosing one priority, environmental priority over another, there may also be important trade-offs. Finally, an important constituency is our overseas trading partners. <laughs> they don't have a vote. They're, they're as underrepresented in the U.S. Congress as children are, right? Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, you'd think they would be completely politically powerless. But they turn out to be influential because key parts of the agriculture sector in the United States rely on exports. And so it's useful to know which crops is that. For example, wheat, wheat producers rely a lot on exports and wheat producers 
are so dependent on the international trade agreements that include a quid pro quo that they become an important voice then for not having our farm subsidy policy be too immiserating for farmers in countries around the world. So most people in an audience like this will have a perspective on the farm bill that's largely negative. Um, there's a sort of a long-standing indictment, which surely is at least mostly true. Um, but I think I think part of the purpose of my talk is to understand when is it true, when is it when is it not true. But uh, from about 15 or 18 years ago, here's here's one version where you think about the dietary guidance that was in place at the time in the form of a pyramid, and then how unbalanced is the farm subsidy portfolio of, of, of supports compared to what would be a healthy diet. A more recent version of this is, um, this is from the journal JAMA Internal Medicine, um, has cross-sectional comparisons across different foods in NHANES according to what is their implied farm subsidy content. And you can see that as you go further to the right to the foods that have more subsidies uh, 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 sort of touching them, that you have higher levels of unfavorable chronic disease outcomes, um, ob obesity, dyslipidemia, and so forth. Now, you're going to catch on as the talk proceeds that this is not really my perspective on how we should think about the causes, the harms done by farm subsidies. Um, for example, meats are not highly subsidized in U.S. agriculture, but the, um, the uh, animal feed is heavily subsidized. And so they count the meat as being a highly subsidized product. But uh, my question is usually not, was this product somehow made impure by being touched by subsidies, but rather, um, what is the effect of subsidies on the prices and on the quantities? You think that from a nutrition perspective, what you really wanna know is are people consuming more unhealthy food because of the farm subsidies? And that's really a different question from whether the foods were touched or untouched by farm subsidies. So the environmental version of this indictment is also important. You could ask, do subsidies favor meat production over plant food? Do subsidies encourage overproduction, causing more nitrogen to flow down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, where it causes hypoxic zones that are both a big environmental challenge, but also that da cause damage to other agricultural stakeholders in fisheries and shrimp production and, and um, other parts of the food system that are important for our healthy diets. Um, does, does the farm subsidy system promote high intensity use of chemical inputs? And does it drive small and sustainable farmers out of business? So as we assess this indictment, we have to think about a number of distinctions. And I may focus so much on distinctions that I run the risk of disappointing my audience by on certain topics being insufficiently opinionated. You know, it, I'll, I'll be sort of saying, well, the farm subsidies differ from each other. There's different designs of farm subsidies. There's different stakeholders, including perhaps more public interest stakeholders than you might at first expect. There's differences between farm subsidy effects on prices and quantities, on meat and crop production, and the whole subsidy system behaves differently in its key impacts during times of abundance when farm prices are low and during times of scarcity when farm prices are high. And so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna sort of hold you by the shoulders and uh, make you learn when in recent years have farm, farm commodity prices been low or high because it's so central to understanding what is the impact and what is the budget scale of different designs of farm subsidies. So let's think quantitatively, what are the facts? And a good, a good source of facts about what the farm bill spending is is the um, maybe Congressional Research Service reports, which get their underlying data from the Congressional Budget Office. And when you read in the newspaper about sort of how big the farm bill is, you know, how many hundreds of pages, how many lines of code, um, it seems like nobody, nobody, how is that even comprehensible? But luckily, everybody thinks incrementally from the previous farm bill. And so the Congressional Budget Office presents a report 
that's very important at the time farm policy is being made. For example, this spring, they're using a May 2023 report from the Congressional Budget Office that explains what would happen if current policy were extended for another five years and for another 10 years. And so you have to sort of make assumptions about what would happen to poverty rates, caseloads in SNAP and so forth. And um, then the policymakers on the ag committees, when they make policy proposals, it gets scored by the Congressional Budget Office by comparison to this baseline. And so everybody is not inventing the whole system from scratch, but is thinking incrementally about what's the strengths, weaknesses, and costs, budgetary costs of different changes that they could make from current practice. So the key thing for understanding the indictment is that the major titles are nutrition, and this is in, in descending order from, from, you know, nutrition is three quarters of the farm bill budget, um, crop insurance. So it's kind of, it's a very much a farm subsidy program, but different in design from what you usually may think of as traditional row crop subsidies. Um, commodity, traditional commodity subsidy programs, th those are the more traditional ones, rank only third, and then conservation programs, where the whole politics also only works because these are major subsidies. Don't think of these as just touchy-feely programs, but they are um, valued by environmentalists, but also valued by production agriculture because they're important sources of farm, farm subsidies. But still, you can imagine they behave differently from traditional row crop, row crop subsidies. Then there's a whole range of smaller programs, which for example are very important in sustainable agriculture advocacy around the farm bill. All of the programs that you'll read for small and disadvantaged farmers or for organic agriculture, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of programs that are important to the political favorable aura around the farm bill all belong in that final $10 billion, right? So these are, these are in some ways enormously important for public relations, perhaps out of scale with their actual impact in the food economy. Um, so the farm bill is not the only important legislation that affects the food system. So you have to think about it in its ecosystem of other important legislation some of which is in as dysfunctional a state of contemporary situation as the farm bill is. So child nutrition reauthorization, for example, like the farm bill was traditionally updated every five years. This is, you know, SNAP is in the farm bill, but WIC and the child nutrition programs are under a different major omnibus legislation called child nutrition reauthorization. But the last time it was properly done was 2010. Um, currently, they sort of struggle along cobbling together um, changes that need to be changed, changed from one year to the next, but haven't really sort of revisited. And that could be in the Farm Bill's future. You know, right now, if you read in the news about the Farm Bill, they're considering postponing it for at least another year just because um, they're currently at an impasse for key decisions that need to be made that I'll talk about in a couple of the late slides. So... Then there's COVID era legislation, which made important temporary changes in nutrition assistance programs and also had a large amount of extra subsidies for farmers to make sure the food system didn't fall apart just in our time of crisis. And the Inflation Reduction Act, which despite its name is an important piece of climate legislation. And you can see in the chart, as if you look at the Congressional Budget Office projections for the next 10 years that I mentioned for the cost of the farm bill, that this, um, these, these climate conservation programs that are outside of the farm bill are a key part of the budget situation for the next several years indicated in yellow. And finally, there's important other environmental legislation that's older, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And these are in some ways settled law but in some ways, they're still with us because the regulations that carry out these programs have to be updated uh, for one, one policy reason or another. And then those updates end up being politically controversial. So part of what you're going to hear are things that for those of you who have taken Nutrition 303, um, the, uh, 
with Ian and, and Leah this past year, it's a little redundant, but I promise that uh, parts of this are what's related to an up update of, of this text, which I'm doing during this sabbatical year, for which I'm grateful to Friedman School's uh, uh, administration. And they, uh, um, uh, so it won't be all redundant, but so the, some of you though will, will have to bear, bear with the slight redundancy. So one of my key messages is that not all subsidies are alike. And that it's important to understand distinctions across perhaps no, no fewer than seven different types of farm subsidies. And for each of these, there's a different thing that we can pay attention to for what is it that the government does under this policy? And what is the effect on producers and on consumers and for the nutrition and environmental indictment and for our trading partners, we wanna know what is the uh, effect on the amount of food if particular types that's produced and sold? So some of these policies increase the farm price. Some of them suppress the farm price. Some of them increase the consumer price or suppress consumer price. Some of them make the quantity that's consumed bigger or smaller. And so we have to think, you know, bear with me while we think through a couple of these in turn. Let's start with traditional price supports. If you ask farmers, what do they want to happen to prices? And then you remember the journalists tell us that the US has a cheap food policy. Ask a farmer, what is their opinion about a cheap food policy? No, they want prices to be higher. And farmers are an important constituency behind US agricultural policy. So it's not surprising that some of these farm subsidy mechanisms have the goal of raising the farm price, not making food cheap. And um, the price supports are one of them. The government offers, if the market price falls below a certain target, the government will buy up a certain amount of commodity and hold it off the market um, uh, until, until prices recover. Now, you've invited an agricultural economist to your Wednesday seminar, and nobody ever wants to see supply and demand charts, or at least you think you don't. Uh, and then I ask you, for what we've been talking about, do you want to know the effect of farm subsidies in a way that distinguishes effects of price, which you can see on the vertical axis here, from the effects of quantity on the horizontal axis? And do you want to know distinctly the effect on producers and consumers? And to think rigorously about the counterfactual, the difference between what would happen with the subsidies or without the subsidies. Against your better judgment, you have just been wishing me to show you some supply and demand charts, right? Um, so the way these work is for the supply function. Each of these you can say, depending on what the price is, what happens to a quantity? So for the supply function, this is just the basic intuitive insight that if the price were higher, farmers would be able and willing to produce more of a commodity such as corn. And on the demand function, if the price were higher, buyers would be willing to buy less um, of, of a commodity such as corn. And in this case, I think your intuition will be best if you think of the buyers not being you eating corn on the cob, but rather if you think of the buyers being the next stage of the food marketing chain, the um, food manufacturing plants who make the, um, uh, the, the fluid that goes into sugar sweetened beverages or the um, uh, ethanol plants that buy corn. Think of those as being the buyers. And imagine that if the government did nothing, the price, there would be some market price, such as in this picture, it's $1.75 per bushel of corn. And that everybody in ag policy agrees that that's not a fair enough price for farmers to earn a decent living and that the actual price should be higher. And so the whole point of the farm subsidy program is to have the price for farmers be, for example, $1.95 per bushel. And in this, the government has to offer to buy up a certain amount of commodity at $1.95 per bushel. And that costs the government up to perhaps billions of dollars. And to, you know, because we're talking about large quantities here, you know, U US corn production is measured in billions of dollars, billions of bushels. And, um, and so, uh, and the government would potentially have to store a lot of it. So 
Policies like this were central in US ag policy from about the 1930s to the start of the 1970s and um, are still with us to, to some extent, but not as central as they, as they used to be. Um, because there's problems with each of these subsidies, policymakers find themselves turning to the next one. And so it's a little, it's a little like uh, uh, being lost in a maze um, looking for an exit where there isn't an exit where none of the policies really make all the stakeholders happy. But one of them that's been used over the years is to limit the supply. If you could only limit the supply, then the government wouldn't have to buy up billions of bushels. You could have the higher price without the trouble of storing, storing the commodity. And um, this was used in the form of quotas over the years, also from about the 1930s to the start of the 1970s. A little bit later for peanuts and sugar and a couple other commodities. But the, um, it's still with us to some extent in the form of some of the conservation programs, which have a softer version of these supply controls, like conservation programs that voluntarily farmers get paid to set aside land and keep it, keep it out of production. The um, deficiency payments are the type of farm subsidy that suppresses the consumer price. And so these, these price suppressing farm subsidies are the ones where you might most worry for nutrition. You might worry that this is making unhealthy food cheaper for consumers and is causing consumers to eat more. And um, I, won't, I won't go through the supply and demand chart for this in detail, but the key thing to remember is that for these deficiency payments, the government writes the farmer a check for the difference between the low market price and the higher price that everybody agrees the farmers sort of deserve. And so um, the government doesn't have to buy up the commodity. It just has to pay farmers. And again, the sum might be in the several billions of dollars only in a year when the price is low. In a year when the market price is low, any of these farm subsidies can cost the government several billion dollars each. In a year when the price is high, these are inexpensive to the government because farmers would just sell it on the market place anyway. Um, okay, because of shortcomings in those subsidies, there have been a variety of more contemporary farm subsidies. This includes crop insurance. It includes decoupled farm subsidies, where the decoupling means that your farm subsidy is not based on how much you produce this year. This is the key principle that either environmentalists or our trading partners want from US farm subsidy is they don't want our subsidies to be based on this year's output because that's the pattern that incentivizes farmers to overproduce, which causes either nutrition or environmental or trade, trade, trade consequences. And so um, each of these is, in, at, it's not really fully decoupled, but close enough on the books to being decoupled that everybody kind of accepts them as being decoupled for policy purposes. And, um, in order to understand um, these variety of farm subsidy programs, you need to be able to think quantitatively. Because if I tell you that we've just gone through six different varieties of farm subsidy programs, and you want to know, OK, what's the bottom line? You need to know how many billions of dollars are going in. So I need to show you charts showing you how many billions of dollars are in each of these types of farm subsidy programs. But before I do that, those charts aren't going to make sense unless you know when were commodity prices low and high. So this first chart, using data from the FAO, tells you when were food commodity prices low or high. And the answer is from about the 1980s, after the food price crises of the 1970s had passed, through the 1980s all the way up to the mid-2000s, commodity prices had been so low for so long that everybody forgot to worry about scarcity. This was a big mistake, right? You know, that, that, that they knew to worry about farmers going out of business or not having a decent living, but they forgot to worry about food scarcity. And then for a number of reasons in the late 2000s, after the Great Recession, with bad luck in both world events and um, weather, there ended up being a series of food shortages and price spikes that were so severe that there were riots in country, you know, in capitals of Egypt and 
uh, low and middle income countries around the world because politically important urban consumers were frightened that they wouldn't be able to afford enough food. And so this is very politically high impact developments when their scarcity and commodity prices are high. There's not much good news in food scarcity and riots, but if there were on the vaguely on the list, way down our list of things to wish for is farm subsidies are inexpensive during times, times like that because the commodity prices are high. So USDA has on the website charts of what happens to the different farm subsidy programs over time. But I find the real clever data comes from not USDA, but from our trading partners who are highly motivated to figure out which of our subsidies is those troublesome subsidies based on output and which of our subsidies is the somewhat more harmless decoupled subsidies. And so I've updated I, from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is kind of like a club of rich countries, has data buried on their website that, uh, that tells us that they carefully analyzed all the US farm subsidy programs and classified them in ways that are useful. And I've put this on a, on a data gadget on the internet so that if these slides are sh shared with you, you can um, have an interactive uh, access to the, to the data. And so what you see for these troublesome farm subsidy designs that are based on output, like the deficiency payments and so forth, um, they actually are a number of billions of dollars during times when commodity prices are low. And then they're almost costless during times when commodity prices are high. And then we get to the weird, just like, have you not noticed that everything in the world around us is in strange times? Uh, so is farm policy. Um, you have this absurd trade war with China with sort of um, repeated cycles of retaliation for one insult after another that would have been politically unpalatable to the government. It would have been politically impossible for the government to engage in this trade war with China if they had had to bear the full brunt of farmers' distress over it. So they established a temporary extra farm subsidy program on the order of many billions of dollars just to hold the farmers indemnified from the harm of the, of the trade, trade war. So that's this spike. And then comes the COVID crisis, just as that spike of farm subsidy payments was ending. So this is, for somebody who's been covering food policy for many years now, this is the strangest chart I ever, I ever saw. And then um, here's the similar chart, but for the farm subsidies that are not based on output. So this is still, you might, these are not necessarily from a public interest perspective, beloved farm subsidies, because they could be a big waste of taxpayer money, but they're probably not the source of harm to the environment or to our trading partners or probably to nutrition. Um, and so that includes these direct payments where you, it's sort of like, you could, it's a little disparaging to say, but like welfare for farmers. Um, and then it includes these uh, crop insurance programs, novel programs like the ARC and PLC. E I could tell you each of these has a distinction that's kind of interesting, but not too interesting. The main point is that this is more billions of dollars than the payments based on output. So if you thought of um, how much is our food tainted by having been subsidized, to me, the taint is not very bad on a lot of the farm subsidies, um, these subsidies that are not based on, not based on output. And then this type of subsidy also had important um, components during the trade war and during the COVID, COVID pandemic. So finally, we come to the one that, you know, there, there's there's parts of what I'm telling you is old hat so much so that I was a little embarrassed. I was telling Aaron, you know, about redundancy be, between what I present and things you might already know. But parts of it are distinctive to having an ag economist by training who's now spent decades in a wonderful school of nutrition science and policy. And um, and so there's things that 
matter more to me than they do to most people. And one of them is the interventions in the farm economy that are designed to increase demand. These stand out to me more than they do in the standard presentation on this topic. If you can see how all the trouble with all these farm subsidies would go away if only buyers just wanted more food in the first place. If you, it's almost the only of these subsidies that increases the price and increases the quantity at the same time. So you can see how this picture of shifting the demand function outward is what a farmer would really dream of or a farm industry lobbyist would really, would really dream of. And so then you're ready, you're ready to think, oh, this is the real bad stuff. But what is on the list of demand expansion? It includes good and bad together, right? It includes the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, where you would greatly misunderstand the politics of food in the United States if you did not recognize that the constituency behind the SNAP program is not just the anti-hunger constituency, although that's an important political constituency, but also the farm constituency, right? Everybody recognizes that total aggregate demand for farmers would be low if we left low-income Americans without resources to buy food in the marketplace, right? That that, that that would be a substantial reduction in how much market there is for what US farmers produce. Um, and then is the commodity checkoff programs that I'll tell you about in a bit. But these, these are programs that advertise beef. It's what it's what's for dinner and pork, the other white meat and things, things like that. Then there's biofuels. So biofuels are from one perspective, like increasing demand. From a farmer's perspective, biofuels are like a whole new source of buyers. You know, about, I think, a substantial amount of U.S. corn, I think, I'm going to say it only roughly. If Tim were here, he would tell me I'm not, I don't have it exactly, or AFE students, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% of our corn goes into biofuels, about 30% into animal feed, and, and um, only the remainder goes into the food, food system more directly. And so the um, biofuels are an important part of the agricultural economy. And um, the thing is, from a nutrition perspective, this isn't really food demand increasing because we burn it up in our gas tanks and in our airplanes. And so um, uh, if your vision of the nutrition indictment is focused on the calorie balance, which is not the only sensible nutrition way to look at it, but it's on the list of things that a nutrition person might be thinking about. Having farmers subsidized to produce lots more corn and then burning it up without it affecting people's weight balance um, has a certain logic to it, right? But um, I don't think most people think about that when they think about what is the effect of farm subsidies on nutrition. So SNAP, um, in order to understand SNAP as demand expansion, you have to know when is SNAP caseloads high and low. SNAP caseloads are countercyclical, so they are higher in general during times of unemployment and, and macroeconomic recession. And they're lower during times of economic expansion when poverty is going down. And they're also sort of systematically higher in recent years. So SNAP has been an increasing part of the food system is now well over 10% of the US population is SNAP participants. Um, the, the budget in the farm bill depends on how many people are on SNAP, but also what is the maximum benefit. And the maximum benefit changes over time a key policy development came not from Congress, but from the administration deep in the federal bureaucracy, because not only the Farm Bill and Child Nutrition Reauthorization, but also the Thrifty Food Plan is traditionally supposed to be updated about every five or six years. And um, it hadn't been updated for a while. Congress told USDA, you have to get your act together and update this Thrifty Food Plan. And USD, at, at that point, the incoming Biden administration said, okay, we'll update it. And the researchers deep in USDA found that they could not get a healthy diet at the inflation update of the previous cost target for the thrifty food plan, which serves as the benchmark cost for the maximum SNAP benefit. And so they said, um, in order to base the SNAP benefit on the thrifty food plan, we're going to have to increase the cost target for the thrifty food plan. 
And they did so in one penny increments in a little computer program that uh, uh, increased the cost target until they found a feasible diet that worked. Um, I see Haley nodding because Haley and I have to, we're working on a project to update the cost, to essentially ground truth the cost of the thrifty food plan, um, sending people into um, grocery stores in 14 states around the country, you know, to see if you really can afford this, this, this diet. So the thrifty food plan is in a certain sense, um, just barely feasible to get a healthy, a healthy diet at this benchmark cost. And um, uh, it's up 21% up higher than it used to be. So in, 20, in 2021, it got increased by about 21% on, on average. So um, this is a topic, much of what I'm telling you is a topic, I hope you don't think you've got somebody who's <laughs> not really a research expert on some of these things. I, I write about all of these, but um, my own quantitative research is about the economics of federal nutrition assistance and and uh, food security measurement, and so this is this is where this conversation today connects a lot with my own quantitative research. So the um, the uh, um, current policy debate in the farm bill turns on. Uh, I'll tell you about a couple of the current controversies, but one of them is um, is these proposals to. Uh, restrict the SNAP benefit to make it only possible only to purchase healthy food, for example. And th th this, th th this version of the restriction proposals, like many are, comes from the Freedom Caucus and the American Enterprise Institute, longstanding critics of excessive social safety net spending. And you can guess that they're taking a little bit of pleasure in uh, having people pay a lot of attention to unhealthy food on SNAP for reasons other than just hoping for uh, better lives for the SNAP participants. But um, the, uh, the um, uh, anti-hunger community is very critical of proposals for restrictions on the SNAP benefit like this that would, that would be more nutrition oriented. Joel Berg, uh, um, who's been on our board of advisors at different times is a well-known uh, anti-hunger anti program advocate. And um, it's interesting to me, first thing is he's always got a great disdainful way of describing unduly paternalistic proposals to have government action make us healthier. But he also connects it to farm subsidies in a way that's connected with, with uh, the topic of today's talk, thinking that we can't, it, it would be hypocritical to have these nutrition restrictions for the low income people at the same time that we uh, subsidize all types of foods regardless of their nutrition profile. So um, uh, I, this is a bit of a digression, but I have a dream, a longstanding dream for a, a different, you know, we've been talking about advocacy coalitions. I've got a different advocacy coalition that would be behind some type of SNAP policy innovation. And this advocacy coalition would include an enthusiastic support from the anti-hunger advocates and nutrition policy advocates. And you, you ask yourself, what's in the Venn diagram that might be at the intersection for those two? It would be something like the following. It would be a, a SNAP restriction pilot where you focus just on sugar sweetened beverages because th th this is the part of the issue that is least like real food. Uh, uh, and um, it would have to have a higher benefit for the arm in a, in, a, in a trial of some sort that has the restriction also has to have something of value. Otherwise it looks to the anti-hunger advocates and probably to anybody who cares about research ethics as unethical because it's below the standard of care. If you just had a restriction and you didn't have anything extra of value for that arm, um, it, 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 it's the sort of thing that would be unethical if you proposed it as a pharmaceutical trial. Um, there, there ought to be genuine pilot scale. <laughs> I mean, the current proposal from the Freedom Caucus is for five states, right? So five states is not really a pilot, that's a rollout. Um, and the uh, beneficial impact should be treated as a question rather than assuming you already know the answer. And 
it should include an ethics trigger um, that takes seriously the concerns that the anti-hunger community expresses. So if they're concerned about stigma, reducing participation and causing paradoxically an effort to promote good nutrition leading instead to hunger and food insecurity, you have to take that seriously in advance. And, and um, okay, the other, the other next form of demand expansion is less valuable from nutrition perspective. It's these commodity checkoff programs. So these programs are not just trade association programs. I think everybody, a lot of people think of these as trade association programs, but it's not private sector like that. It, these, these programs are established by Congress, appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture, funded by mandatory assessments on the farmers. And because some farmers have questioned the mandatory assessments, there's a history of litigation over these programs where um, the farmers asked, hey, why are you allowed to tax us? And the answer is, we're allowed to tax you because this is the our public interest message. And this has led to sort of legal declarations that all of these advertising messages really reflect the government's own message, kind of like um, wear your seatbelt when you're driving and uh, lay your infant on its back instead of on its tummy. Um, public interest messages also include eat more pork and eat more beef. And um, this just seems to me in tension with the dietary guidance that's supposed to be the authoritative statement for federal government communication on nutrition and health. Um, I get, because I'm more opinionated on it, I, I sort of told you I'm at risk of not being opinionated enough to make, make a, a, a sort of a lively presentation. But the, uh, on this, I'm kind of opinionated. And so journalists learn to call me on, on this particular topic. And like the one on the left, um, wanted to know about the research that gets funded by these checkoff programs. And I have to be gentle because very good people get funded, have their research funded by checkoff programs. But I just kind of say, if you really wanted it to be less subject to concern about research bias, you would make the selection of the projects more independent from the funder. And um, that's a non-starter. You know, the, 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 the pork board would not, you know, the pork board has a letter of intent stage where they kind of vet the proposals for how friendly is the proposal. And then only then do you get, do you get to write your actual research proposal. And it's not, um, it's not the recipe for full independence. And then uh, Politico just this last month, uh, I didn't mean this to be outrageous. The, the funny thing is, you can read this quote as if it was meant to be understated. I know it doesn't come out that way, but this is like the least that the government ought to do is that the, the government shouldn't be hiding marketing messages through social media influencers in order to get people to eat more beef during a time of climate crisis and high rates of chronic disease, right? So um, think of that not as um, me being out of, out of line, but instead as, as, as sort of a minimal hurdle for what distinguishes good policy from bad policy on nutrition. Um, so what are the current debates? Um, the leading debate is not one you would have necessarily come up with. The leading proposal that's probably currently got the farm bill stalled is to move funding from the nutrition programs, three quarters of the farm bill budget, and the environment, this large new uh, climate oriented funding source from the IRA, instead into more traditional farm subsidies for commercial agriculture. And this heavy proposal from the majority leadership in the House has um, sort of broken the usually bipartisan opinion on the farm, the agriculture committees in the House and the Senate. And so um, currently it, it may stall completion of the farm bill this spring. There's other proposals. Um, the sustainable agriculture proponents would like a cap on how much comparatively rich households get through farm subsidies. And they like a lot of these small, small programs for organic or sustainable or underrepresented race and ethnicities or um, historically disadvantaged populations in the farm community. And the um, 
protecting SNAP is the leading priority for the anti-hunger constituencies and subsidizing healthier crops or restricting SNAP benefits might be commonly heard themes in nutrition policy circles. I have a list of my own and no, this, these have no particular political constituency behind them. This is just my little wish list is to be entertained would be reform of checkoff programs, which is small, you know, in a sense, smaller scale, but you can see why they stand out more sorely for me than some farm subsidies. Um, simplify and further decouple farm subsidy programs. So at the end of the day, you all were very patient to hear from me about this variety of farm subsidies, but the complexity of it is in part purposeful, right? It keeps, it, ke it holds critical scrutiny at bay. And I wish the farm subsidy programs were a good deal simpler with the main trade-offs starker and more transparent for public deliberation. If you did that though, you would, you know, for example, suppose you want US agriculture to be more climate friendly. One way to do it is to have commodity prices be low. And in order to make climate friendly agriculture affordable, a whole complex array of particular conservation programs. So that's the current strategy. And it's important to environmentalists, but I find myself thinking, how did we find ourselves here? Um, what if, <laughs> What if we actually just had rules that were more binding, that paid workers a fair wage, and that made sure that farm production practices had limits on how much greenhouse gas emissions could be? And if you had binding rules like that, the food would be somewhat more expensive to produce. And our question then is, how do we have a food system that's more resilient to the higher prices that we would see under a market, under an efficient market system, if we took seriously the demands of justice, environment, and nutrition. And, um, and I think SNAP would be a key part of that, right? Like we would, we would have to not panic over, for example, beef prices being higher. Sometimes in nutrition circles or in the environment circles, there's dreams of tax, you know, like Peguvian taxes, where you would make the unhealthy or the unenvironmental product more expensive. But nobody likes taxes, right? Um, once you stand, who can stand up and say, I want you to pay more for beef, right? No, I think it's more promising. <laughs> we got a couple of heads up in the audience. That's terrific. Um, but I think it's more promising to have externalities managed to have wages managed in a way that's got a sense of justice and fairness, and then to not panic over the resulting high prices for a product such as beef. And it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of the same in substance in a way, but it's different in tone from saying, um, as a policy proposal, I would like you all to pay more for beef. Um, the, and then there's these snap snap uh, changes. So just to summarize, what have, what, what have we covered? <laughs> We've covered distinctions across subsidy designs, across stakeholders, across prices and quantities, meat and crop production, and times of abundance and scarcity. And I think you've already now got five or eight or 10 distinctions that are not commonly heard when public debate over the farm bill takes place. So what are your questions? What, what do you wish I'd covered that I, that, that, that I had? Yes. Thank you, Park. It's Chris. That was great. Um, so one question around your five bullet points for a pilot um, sugar sweetened beverage reduction one of them was um, those who would receive restriction should get incentivized in some way, shape, or form. Presumably, they'd get the same amount. So what over and above would you be recommending for a benefit? Um, I actually wasn't necessarily assuming they would get the same amount. I thought, um, what would really 
make what would really raise an eyebrow in the anti-hunger organization leadership and make them say, okay, so traditionally we've imposed opposed this sort of thing, but now we're interested would be a higher benefit. So if you thought about, if you thought about actually testing a higher benefit and um, restrictions, imagine that there were a SNAP program that had a more generous, more generous benefit um, but also that people just accept it as a little bit of a quid pro quo, that it was going to be more health oriented. Yeah. And then my second question is around um, the projections with Ozempic and Wagovi and the weight loss drugs that are on the right. market. And if things go the way they might in five or 10 years from now, the consumption patterns in the U.S. are going to be really different, which right. will impact a lot of things that you talked about. I just wondered, have you seen any modeling around sort of both food production and consumption and even SNAP recipient utilization related to the projections with the um, pharmaceuticals? I I haven't, you know, I, I, I sort of should have made a special point to look out for that because I'm sort of aware of coverage in the media and haven't been reading hard research on that, but that seems like, if it hasn't already been written, that seems like a very good paper. Yeah. What are the ag policy implications of, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, pork, pork. Plug, Can plug I our last, that? Pork. our last seminar will be about, our last scheduled seminar is about these drugs. Okay. And so it'd be great to have more of a community conversation at that time as well. Go ahead, Eileen, Promote and then yeah. we can take. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to build on what Chris said. I was at a series of presentations last week in uh, Washington and the whole issue of what they called health injustice came up because I think Chris mentioned Ozempic, but these, these drugs are extraordinarily expensive. So we're really getting into a situation of have and have nots. I'm not sure where this plays out, but can I, since I'm as, asking you a question, Bernie Sanders, when he ran for uh, president in 2016, talked about uh, these, I think he talk, called them sin tax tax. Um, can you comment on why he saw these as very regressive? Right, on taxes being regressive. So they- so, uh, like to, uh, to, to sodas, for example. Right, to sodas, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So they, um, uh, that that is a topic on which I've written. Uh, so they, um, can, can I tell you? So, but, I'm giving you a nice segue to your research. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, um, ag economists in, in a health sciences campus so often get asked to work on cost-effectiveness analysis, which is a very interesting topic. We're sometimes a little reluctant because it feels to us uh, um, more like accounting than it does like the interesting social science part. But uh, with, with Dari and colleagues, I um, persuaded a team of people to work on the part of the sugar sweetened beverage taxes that I really found most intriguing, which was what is the distinct effects? What do different stakeholders have at stake in this? And so we've got a paper about sugar sweetened beverage taxes that looks at the cost effectiveness analysis overall, but then looks separately at each of the stakeholder groups, including um, five groups of consumers, strata of consumers broken out by essentially income. It was really by what's their source of health insurance. But, you know, some people are better off and some people are worse off um, based on what health insurance they get. And then the sugar sweet beverage companies. It's and so you could see you could see yeah. that um, yeah. these taxes are seen in health sciences research as being a wash because, you know, um, they're sort of like a net zero to society. Some people pay, pay other people get the money. And so it doesn't count. It counts as a zero in total. Whereas I think to the people who actually pay the tax, um, it, 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 it matters. But I should say in that study, every income strata benefited from sugar sweet beverage taxes. Sure, sure. Because um, uh, health, chronic, if you count chronic disease as a reduction as a benefit, then even with the payments for the sugar sweet and beverage tax, all five strata were better off, um, lower income strata, we're not as much better off as others. And so you can see why it was an issue, why it's a stressful issue thinking about whether these taxes are regressive, but they are in a sense, still very good policy, you know, very good nutrition policy. Okay, I'll ask, uh, uh, 
Hawk, I'll add to that. Last week, the issue of uh, consumer sovereignty, consumers' Consum rights to choose. I'm sorry, Absolutely. let me add. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me add. So consumers want the information, but they don't want to be told what to do. So from the point of view of like behavior change, what would you target? Oh, um, yeah. So nobody, you can see, Eileen, why am I not more influential? It's partly because I'm, I'm, I'm out of step with everybody on a question like this. But you all are influential. I'm tell you, I can't tell you, Paul, how many people have read your book. Oh, the, the, yeah. Well, one day, one day, one day, maybe it will have more influence. So the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the thing is, I consider dietary guidance to be respectful. There is a sense in the way policy debates and nutrition policy in the United States are framed that treats taxation and um, dietary guidance as if they are um, totally un-American limitations on human freedom. Whereas I think- Absolutely, tax absolutely, yeah. Taxation and dietary guidance both seem to me at the respectful end of the paternalistic spectrum because uh, taxes make it a little more expensive to buy something, but nobody's telling you you can't buy it. And dietary guidance takes your decision-making seriously. Here's something for you to consider. Uh, whereas actually, everybody tolerates having people not be able to buy something because their income is too low. We take that in the United States, we take that as part of daily life, as if it was like given by a divine deity. Um, no, I consider that odd. That's what seems strange to me. Whereas uh, uh, accepting, accepting advice on what's the balance of scientific evidence for nutrition and, and health connections uh, seems to me more reasonable. But so as, cap, as, Paul, as Paul, your question implied, no, that's not Paul, what- can I add there? I'm sorry, because you're, you're going to run out yeah. of time. I mean, based on, for example, the Mexico data, sure, you increase the price, price of, let's say, sodas, and the lowest income consumers buy less. We don't know what they're purchasing. But we don't know whether that, again, the consumer sovereignty, whether that long term influences an improvement in their diet and public health. Health. That's right. Thanks. Let's let, let's take it to a couple more questions before we close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Park. This was excellent. Um, so my question is sort of going to just be broad and theoretical and ask for your advice um, for like us trainees, students, postdocs in the room as we're entering our careers in fan app um, or food policy. So for example, I will just be fully out there and admitting that I, I'm more in the camp of the anti-hunger group in terms of restriction for SNAP. But when we're thinking of sort of positioning our careers and addressing potentially controversial topics, how would you sort of advise us to navigate these lines on super right. controversial topics such as this? You know, Everybody has to make career compromises. I think that um, sometimes you're tempted not to have a career, for example, in the food or beverage industry, or the, 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 those decisions are up to you. But I would never advise, I would never presume to advise people saying something to that effect, to say, hey, that, that career path would be un unethical. Um, instead, you are trained here to understand multiple stakeholder perspectives and to see what makes them tick, that is valuable no matter who your employer ends up being. And it's not just valuable, it can serve the public interest well, right? So which, what, if, if you work for an anti-hunger organization and there's a controversy between nutrition policy advocates and anti-hunger advocates, just being somebody who understands what was the logic behind the nutrition policy position is still valuable, even if at the end of the day, that's not your employer's employer's position. So I think uh, uh, be, being sort of a good and sympathetic listener is valuable, no matter which, which, which career path you take. That's great advice. Maybe we have time for a super quick question and quick answer. Park, uh, that answer that you just gave uh, is, an encapsulation of something that uh, you and I have been discussing since we uh, made the great effort to uh, recruit you here from the ERS. Uh, the whole business about uh, uh, 
um, how to use the kind of of uh, not just economic but uh, but scientific investigation to have an influence on on policy, and um, and I'm I'm really grateful. Uh, I think we all are for for what you've just uh, uh, brought us through. I'm wondering uh, on the matter of of being more influential which is something that, again, we've been talking about over the years. Uh, how much, uh, what are the mechanisms by which the kind of message that you're presenting here can be uh, made available to a larger audience? Uh, obviously, we're, we're grateful to be able to discuss this here, you know, within the confines, and we're glad to hear your you're writing a book, but uh, my suspicion is that uh, the, the book may not be uh, totally directed to uh, uh, a lay population. But the question is, how can we how can we do a better job of of making the science that we're involved in uh, available? to uh, the public so that it uh, has even a greater influence on policy. I, I, um, I think in some ways, you know, people give this a lot of thought. How can our research affect public policy more than it does? And some of it is I think of people like Chris, where I learned from about implementation science. I think I think that more of the NIH funding mechanisms, for example, allow you to have part of your proposal be devoted to, to um, actually having an impact, not so much policy advocacy, they probably wouldn't encourage, but at least implementation. Um, and to the extent that it feels like that's limited, um, some of that is, I, I don't wanna, it's not, this is not a despairing message, but it's um, sometimes there really was no better way to, solve all problems at the same time, to both be true to the story you have to tell and um, highly impactful and persuasive with, with a large audience. Instead, sometimes you just have to stick with the story you have to tell, even recognizing that that may cost you some of your, some of your audience. Yeah. Thank you so much, Parker. We have another round of applause and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you so much. That was yeah.